it also makes it easier that you don't think the guy up there has all the answers anyway. So, All right, let's open up our scriptures if you have them. We're in Luke this morning in the second chapter. And after three days, they found Jesus in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know? that I must be in my father's house. But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And then Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. It's the word of God for us, the people of God, when we say, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Yeah, I've lost my children a time or two. There's the definition of great anxiety. <laughs> Must be the only one who's lost your kid in a crowd. That's fun. Not. So I would have really loved a mail-it-in sermon this week of all weeks, <laughs> but I applaud all of you for your questions. Uh, it gave me a, a great break to sit and do research and to dig and to dig. So I did grab a few softball questions for all the reasons that we know why I grabbed some softball questions. But as I joked and I picked up the box, y'all were busy while I was gone. So now I'm wondering if July may be a continuation. But we'll see how this goes. This could be fun. So we are doing the Ask Me Anything, and I want to clarify, you're not asking God anything, okay? Just for those of you that are keeping score at home, you're asking me anything. So I will try to be, and I, I don't know another phrase to use, so just keep it in your mind and, and let it go. I'm trying to be as fair and balanced as possible when I answer your questions, because I don't want to give you just my point of view, okay? So Jesus and when we ask questions, one of my uh, favorite translations of this particular text. Um, Greek's a little complicated. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that as we go into the series. And so part of the complication is understanding the context and understanding where words move. There is a translation that says that they were amazed by his questions, not that they were amazed by his answers. And the reason why I like that one is because you know someone's knowledge by the depth of the questions that they ask. If they ask a very elementary question, then they have a very elementary knowledge of, of, of the question. You can also tell someone if you're knowledgeable about something when they're reaching, right? They're making up stuff to make themselves sound smart, right? You don't know any of these people, but they exist, and they try to make up a question that makes them sound smart, except it makes them sound really, really dumb to all the people that are very knowledgeable. And I appreciate that Jesus is in the temple asking questions. And if Jesus can ask questions, I think that gives lots of us permission to ask questions. And so that's why I started this sermon series with that particular passage as a reminder to us that questions matter. Questions matter to God. Questions matter to each other. We will read a, another passage later, and it talks about wrestling with the questions, wrestling with God, and that's okay, too. I'm going to invite you to also disagree with me wholeheartedly. That's okay. My ego is solid. I'm okay. You can disagree with me. That's why it's asking me anything, not asking the pastor down the street. But I'll also caution you. You might not like the answers that you get, because I don't like all the answers I get when I read Scripture either. And I invite you to wrestle with that as well. We ask questions so we can grow, so we can dig. And quite honestly, as I'm working my way through this, I'm having fun because I'm digging deeper into some of these things going, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Didn't think about it like that. It's making me dig, which makes my faith grow deeper and wider. So in a lot of ways, I want to thank you. 
because this is not a mail-it-in sermon series. You're making me take a class. I haven't taken a class in a while, so that's okay. All right, so we have a bit of the history of questions that we kind of went over. Jews asked a lot of questions. Some of them will come up here because our, our Jewish and Hebrew friends were not stupid. A lot of times we think, we're so smart, those people back then, they were really dumb. No, they weren't, because... Do you believe dinosaurs and people were on the earth at the same time? By the way, you're not the first to ask this question, and we weren't the first to discover dinosaur bones either. They struggled with the same thing. There are actually a lot of traditions that come into ancient history that dinosaur bones were put there to trick people, that they had to either believe what was in the ground or they had to believe in God. That's how they had to deal with it. And they said, well, though, God put those dinosaur bones there to fool us or to trick us because this is a test. Because that's what the ancient gods did. They tested people. And so this was just another test. Do you believe what's in the ground or do you believe what, you know, the scripture tells us? And the Jewish faith weren't the only ones who had this particular explanation because what explanation do you have for this big old thing? And then does this big old thing run with the human beings, right? So... Uh, do I personally believe that dinosaurs and people were on the earth at the same time? And the easy answer is, this is a bit of an oxymoron, but homo sapien means wise human. I don't know how that came to pass, but apparently we're wiser than our predecessors. Not sure how, but we are wiser. We are in a long line of different types of humanoids that came along. Now, do you believe in evolution? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm a theologian more than I am a scientist, although, just as in this children's sermon, I love how science explains how God created things. At the end of the day, you have to have some origin of something, and until somebody comes up with an explanation of an origin, I got one, and I'm good with that. I'm also good with the fact that God doesn't explain everything. I will remind you several times when we get into Scripture that Scripture does not explain everything. It explains all things needed to know and love God. And in that, you will get salvation. That's all it says. Find computer in scripture and I'll give you a million dollars. Because it ain't there. Just like some other new invention, AI, or whatever AI is going to invent. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to wrestle with that. And we're going to have to go back to scripture. And we're going to have to go, how does God teach us to handle all of these things? At the end of the day... When bronze was first invented, people were very scared because bronze was a new weapon. And they had to wrestle with this new weapon. So every time human beings try to create something more to get over something else, there's a reference somewhere in scripture. You gotta dig a little bit, you gotta kinda pull the analogies in, but there will be something new, there will be something exciting. And so I enjoy science, mainly because my wife does science every day, right? takes my blood pressure, makes sure that I'm eating right, making sure that, you go to a doctor, you're doing science. So you can't throw science out, you just can't. And so part of that is making them work and making them talk together. Um, and so, so far science tells me that uh, humans and dinosaurs did not walk at the same time, and by humans I mean homo sapiens. Maybe there was some other thingamabobber, but You'll have to go to the Paleontology Museum, I think, to get a better answer out of that. So that was an easy one. Can you explain dinosaurs in the Bible? Yes, I can. Now we're in my territory. Here we go. So not really. Because in Job, uh, there's a, a chapter in Job called the behemoth, right? And it talks about this behemoth of a creature that is bigger than anything else. They've tried to explain it away as a big elephant and it doesn't work. And part of that is when you start going through all of the Old Testament, you start pulling out all of these references to these large le leviathans or the Tanyan, a sea monster, a serpent, a dragon, and the size that they give doesn't make any sense. It's not an elephant that you can ride, it is something unfathomably big. A leviathan, nothing on earth is its equal. And this is one of my favorite little like Clearly, it's not an elephant. Its tail is likened to a cedar tree. So a cedar tree, if you've ever seen a cedar tree, those are those things in like California, like those big old cedar trees. We're not talking about a sapling here. We're talking about a cedar tree. Think about this. You're trying to clear a field. 
you're trying to grow crops, all of a sudden you come about a cedar tree in the ground that's attached to another cedar tree and you dig the whole thing up and yes, we call that archaeology, they call it, you're in my way while I'm trying to plant my crops. And they find these things because they're ancients, they're not stupid. And they have to figure out a way to go, well, if this is a dead one, uh-oh, there's probably a live one running around somewhere, and then they start keeping an eye out for a live one. So to them, they have no idea the dinosaurs are 400 million years old. They just know a dead one is here, and somewhere around, that thing might be coming back. They have no concept that this is an ancient thing. They just know there's a dead carcass here with legs the size of a cedar tree. And so, You've got dinosaurs like the Brachiosaurus. I can't do that part. That's not my Latin gift. Anyway, Apatosaurus and Saltiosaurus? Sure. Um, they had huge tails that easily could be compared to a cedar tree. And so, of course, when you find these things, you write them down. Oh, well, God must have made this thing, and be careful. Don't make it mad. Otherwise, this thing's going to come back. Is it coming back? Probably not. No. But they're ancients. They don't know that. But there are all kinds of references to large animals, large types of things that are in the Old Testament especially. Not too much in the New Testament, mainly because Jesus didn't hang out with the dinosaurs. I don't know. You'll have to ask God why that didn't happen, but that's fine. But in the Old Testament, you'll find these references all over the place. So, all right. So when we get to this particular part, because I'm going to transition... Any questions about dinosaurs in the Bible at this point? This is where you get to do follow-ups. Okay, we're all good with dinosaurs in the Bible? Woohoo! Go science. All right. Do you think pets can go to heaven? This is not a softball question. Thank you for um, you know throwing this one out. So I'm gonna go with the best one I've got. All things return to God. So it's a beautiful ancient. Um, idea before a long history of discussion and arguments. There was a question about whether or not you retain your individual soul or whether or not all things just return to God. That's the Pharisees and Sadducees. When you see they're like, what's the difference between the Pharisees? The simple, easiest explanation besides the fact that both of them thought two mountains were significant. But they had a disagreement about whether or not your individual soul survived or whether or not you went back to the collective. No one knew, no one knew. And so we believe as Christians, and Jesus speaks about this, of, of our soul and our new bodies and all of that going back to God. At the end of the day, Revelation talks about it, the, the Hebrew scriptures talk about it, Jesus talks about it, that all things will cry out and return to God. Well, if you return to God, where is God? God is in heaven, if all things return back to God, I'm going to go with yes, because where else is it going to go? So the answer is yes. Do I know what my new body is going to look like? No. Do I know what Stinky is going to look like? That was the name of my first dog. I was five when I named him. Not my fault. It's the name of my dog. Uh, I don't know what form Stinky is going to take when I get to heaven, but I know that all things return to God because God created all things and all things return back to God. Am I going to get into the long diatribe of making something up of like, yes, it's going to be like this? No, because no one knows. That's why I trust God. And so I trust that all things will return to God. And so that brings me comfort. I miss my Siberian Husky. Oh, I miss Sheba. Yeah, I know. That was, that was my favorite puppy anyway. Okay, so for the longer form of the evening, morning, why do you say bread and cup and not bread and juice? Oh, somebody pays attention. Well done. Okay. So we're going to start with a little theological background. Click. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Okay. So in order for communion to work, I don't own communion. Communion's been around a lot longer than me. And so we have to understand that communion is an ancient practice that actually predates Jesus. It goes all the way back to the Passover, and Passover adopted it from something else. So this is not anything new. 
So when I reference something that's new, I'll let you know about it. So we move in a very long line of tradition of understanding where this comes from. This is an ancient practice, a very ancient practice. And so it's with that ancient practice that I don't like to touch this. By touching this, I mean, you notice I pull the book out every single month. And I try not to deviate from that book very, very much because I've read from Justin Martyr all the way back. Justin Martyr wrote down back to the emperor, this is what they say when they're taking communion because the emperor was trying to kill Christians and Justin Martyr went, look, they're not vampires and flesh eaters. They're taking the body of Christ and this is what happens and this is what they prayed. So Justin Martyr writes down the mass, writes down the exact same words that we say. It gives me goosebumps because that's 2,000 years ago and we're saying the exact same words. And so I try not to mess with that, mainly because I don't want to get struck by lightning. That's an Old Testament joke. But anyway, you don't want to do that. So I have a lot of reverence for what happens at the communion table. So we go from ancient times to Hebrew Jewish Passover, and I'm going to speed you up to Catholic and Orthodox theology. Why? Because hey, we're United Methodists, and United Methodists came from Methodists, and Methodists, we're working backwards, came from Anglicans, and Anglicans came from Catholics and Orthodox. We didn't make this up. This has been passed down from our Hebrew and Jewish friends into Roman Catholics and Orthodox, and I put them together because they don't like to mess with it either. So there's two things. There's form and matter. So form is on page 12. That's the words that we say. And form matters because you cannot do things without a certain form. Good example, we believe in how many baptisms for the forgiveness of sins? One. So how many times can you get baptized? You can remember your baptism 700 times, doesn't matter. And the reason why we have one baptism, and it was kind of fun, because when the priest came in and we had this little like, hey, I'm Methodist clergy, you gonna let me take communion in the Catholic Church? And depending on who was there, he was very kind. But it was a concern, because my brother's not a practicing Catholic, and clearly I'm somewhere else on Sunday. So we had this quick little like theological discussion and he went very simply, are you baptized? Yes, in the Trinitarian formula was my response. And he went, then you can take communion. Because of that baptism, you have to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the form. In baptism, the matter, the physical element, is water. Okay? Now, before all of you run out and decide that you can do this, you can do this. Baptism is the one sacrament that's not limited by a guy in a collar. Anyone could do it. Emergency situation? Doesn't matter. Water in the gutter? Doesn't matter. Baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What if I have to be a Christian to baptize people? No, you don't even have to be a believer. Anyone can do it because the sacrament isn't controlled by the guy in the collar. The sacrament's controlled by God. God is the one who does the grace. God is the one who invokes it. And so you have to have form and you have to have matter. There are people that baptize only in the name of the Spirit. There are people that baptize only in the name of the Father. We could have a long discussion of whether or not they are Christian and we could have a long discussion of whether or not they are part of the group, but the simple answer is the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Anglicans, and the Methodists would say, no, you're not baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because you didn't have the right form. You were baptized only in one without the form. So form and matter matters. You have to have both. Okay? So, getting to our wonderful sacramental grace is given. And grace is given to us to help make us holy. And so, in my world, that's not my baby. I get to do it and participate because the United Methodist Church said I had enough credits at my seminary and that I'm not a complete idiot. And they said, go and make communion. And I said, sure. And so there are churches that don't have a pastor that can make communion. We have to, I really don't like doing it, but we can consecrate and then we can hand it off and then someone else can hand it out. That's, you could call that a Eucharistic minister in the Catholic Church. It's someone who dispenses communion, okay? So 
that's really important to me. And I might mess with a few words that I know aren't ancient words. But when it comes to the ancient words, I will read them off that paper like my life depended on it because that's important to me. So, boom. So why is this a thing now? Well, because, well, Methodists are Methodists. So in the 1800s, there's an epidemic of alcoholism. Now, remember, this predates all kinds of things. So we're like 2,000 years old. We have the formula, we have the form and the matter, and you don't touch it. In the 1800s, we had alcoholism all over the place. Like we don't have it now, but I guess they just thought it was a bigger deal. See, the United Methodist Church used wine. Now, juice is never juice before 1913. So what happens in 1913? Anybody? Pop quiz? Refrigeration. You cannot, even if you have pasteurization, you still got to have refrigeration. So before 1913, you have no refrigerator. So that means before 1913, there's no such thing as juice. Because the moment that you squeeze that puppy and put it into a jar, fermentation is already happening. It's already happening. It doesn't matter if it's on the shelf for 45 minutes. It's already doing its magical bubbling. The longer you leave it on the shelf, you know what happens. Yeah, okay, so understand that in the ancient texts, and we can get really dive into the deep part, they had different levels of alcohol, right? And for just very simple purposes for the discussion point, uh, what Jesus had at the Last Supper and what Jews had used from the beginning of time is the water is not clean to drink. They don't turn on faucets. They bathe and drink and throw their garbage in the same stream. So what is the cleanest thing? Freshly squeezed juice that is slightly fermented with alcohol. And so it's basically dinner wine or table wine. It's low grade, it's not high in alcohol, but it's safe enough to drink, and that's what you had at dinner. You had table wine. Then there is medium drink and what's called strong drink. Now strong drink would be your Jägermeister people, right? Where they intentionally made sure that that puppy was as high octane as they possibly could get it, right? And so you have to go back to the Greek to understand the difference between strong drink, medium drink, and table wine. And they wouldn't say the words table wine because why would you say something for what is considered common? And so when they say, when Jesus took the cup, we all know what is in there because they knew what was in there. Nobody has to explain something. Because in they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have pasteurization. And so the United Methodist Church comes along in the 1800s, and they have juice. And not everybody has access to freshly squeezed grapes, especially in the wintertime. So they try to kind of do the freshly squeezed grapes, and then they run into the church. And not all churches can do it, and it's, it's a cluster. It's a whole problematic thing. And so this guy named Thomas B. Welsh, yes, Welsh is grape juice. He's a dentist. And so he starts with Dr. Welch's unfermented wine, notice it says wine, uh, pure grape juice. And so he took the pasteurization process and started perfecting this process. And after four years, it was a catastrophe. Nobody wanted it, nobody cared. Nobody cared, nobody wanted it. He tried to push it, nobody cared, nobody wanted it. And because we are a consumer-based society, friends, his son Charlie started marketing it and started paying for ads at annual conferences and going around and doing articles. And then they were going to circuses and they were putting on a show and da 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 da. And then annual conferences went, huh, well, we're going to run ads for your thing. And so that's how Welch's grape juice went from blah 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 to hoo hoo. And so that's how we ended up with juice here. When I say the word juice, it's because it's a pasteurization process that turns it into juice that is what we drink because it's not alcoholic because we have friends who struggle with addiction. And I'm okay with that. So, I have to land on cup because I can't use the word juice. Because when Jesus took the cup, he didn't take juice. That's not what happened. And I don't like substituting modern things into ancient things. Does God care? I don't think so. Does God honor what we're attempting to do to help people stay sober? I think so. I think so. But it's also important to acknowledge 
two things. I can't say the word juice because Justin Martyr didn't say the word juice, nor did anybody else say the word juice. But I know cup exists, and cup is translated several times when Jesus took the cup. Cup, 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 cup. I don't have to say wine, because that's not wine. But it is a cup. And so, it's a great question. It's a, it's a nice little hole to fall down. But it's one of those things that it's a, it's a delicate balance as we continue to move into different phases of how we do things. Good, good example is we have gluten-free now, right? Still bread, I think they still call it bread, isn't it? It's, yeah, still bread. If they didn't call it bread and they called it something else, why, well, because they call it an impossible burger now, right? But that's not, an, that's not a burger, right? It's an impossible burger, which is, I don't know. But we would still use, we would still use something Correct me if I'm wrong, because I didn't look up this part, but gluten-free means there's no wheat in it? They make it out of rice. They make it out of rice, okay? So, a traditional imagery of communion is what? The wheat, the barley, right? Which has gluten in it, right? So, I can, I, I'm safe with bread, because it's still called bread, and we're fine. But we want people to participate. And as I've mentioned before, what if you're allergic to grapes? Well, guess what? You can still have the bread and it counts. You don't have to have both. You don't, only, you don't get 50% Jesus. That's not how it works. You can only have one. Because the Catholic Church now, if you go to a Catholic Church, when I was a kid, you, you went to one and you got the cup. You went one and the other. And they had to do this huge education after COVID, like, look, you guys are not getting 50% Jesus. If you just get the bread, you're getting all of it. And you are. You don't have to take the cup. We do it a little more, I don't know, sanitary, I guess is a good word, with the disposable cups and what have you. Um, and that drives people nuts, and that's a conversation for another day. So any questions about communion? Because we're just going to segue right into it. So any, any other questions, follow-up? OK, then. I have no idea where we are in time, but we're just going to go straight to communion. Where are we at? Over? I don't know. Five till. Not bad. I'm going to use my watch this morning. All right. Page 12, friends. So I'm used to being up there. Now I've got to come down here and grab it. <laughs> 